Let's try it again. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Byron Soji Thomas, and we have traveled all the way from Maryland to come here. Uh, we are with the Health Policy Research Consortium, and our group is interested in the intersection between uh, public health and public policy, uh, specifically what role public policy has in improving health outcomes here in the Mid-Atlantic region. So, Maryland, District of Columbia, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. So, we have done a number of these health policy forums to start a conversation about um, what, what audiences can learn about their role in influencing the health policy discussion. So, today's conversation is going to be about what you as a health advocate or as an ordinary citizen or as a student or as a policy maker need to know um, about the policy process and how it helps to impact health. We have assembled a, a very distinguished panel of speakers and we're looking forward to it. But um, a, a couple things. About the food, we only planned enough for the people who signed up ahead of time. So folks who were registered online and signed up ahead of time, we counted you and provided for you. For anybody else who unfortunately was not able to sign up because you didn't know about the sign up, um, we would ask that you wait until well, the people that signed up are, are served. And um, then, uh, you know, we'll go from there. But uh, please, we're going on an honor system for that. Um, and um, before we so the food, though, I'd like to introduce my teammates. Um, our director, Crystal Reed, is in the back, waving. <laughs> and Russell Blow standing right next to her. And Mafuli Cocker standing at the table. And last but not least, Maya Miller, who is a DSU alum. And who's largely responsible for pushing the ignite button to get us to come here. Thank you, Maria. And so, at this point, um, before we go to the food table, I'd like to call uh, Dr. Erica Taylor to come to the stage and bring us a welcome on behalf of the department and the university. Welcome. Um, as Byron said, this is a, the first time we're having this event here, thanks to Yana, who was a former student who contacted us. So it's great to see our alum out there making a difference in public health. But I'm really looking forward to a great day. And on behalf of you know, Public and public, uh, public Fitness Leaders Day, Department of Public and Allied Health Sciences, we welcome you. And we hope that um, this really is a good session for you that you can take a lot out of it and kind of put public health into practice and, um, and what you do. And for the students, especially those of you who might not be as familiar with some of the things that are going on in public health, uh, hopefully this is eye-opening about the opportunities that you do have in public health. I know I see public health majors, I see some movement science majors who might be less familiar with options in public health, but really consider what they're talking about and the work they're doing because this is another area to use your degree that you might not have been exposed to yet or might not know about. So really kind of keep an open mind and think about how this might apply to what you want to do in the future in terms of um, graduate programs or even working in the field. Um, Liana did her internship here and then was hired um, and has been working there. So you know, take advantage of the opportunity that you have with folks here that you do. You have some really um, top-notch public health professionals here who've done a lot in the field and a great way we've kind of been talking about the theme about networking. Take advantage of the opportunity you have to meet these people today and to network and get to know what you can do and how you might be able to use your degree differently than you might have thought. So welcome, enjoy the day, and learn as much as you can. Um, in, the, in the interest of time, I would like to crave your indulgence. I want to introduce our keynote speaker before we go get the food. And as soon as you get your food, uh, Dr. Rete can come and begin speaking just because she has a tight schedule today and she would like to uh, leave as soon as she's done. So I would like to introduce her um, before we get the food and after we get the food, she can begin her uh, presentation. Dr. Carol Thomas Rete is the director of the Division of Public Health, uh, which is within the Delaware Health and Social Services. Uh, 
department here in the state. She is a physician um, who graduated from the Medical University of Ohio and then completed a pediatric residency at Georgetown University. Um, she, under, under, the, under her leadership and by working closely with communities, she has identified, identified five strategic priorities for her department. To improve health-related lifestyles by reducing obesity, to improve access to quality and safe health care by implementing health reform, to achieve health equity by improving the health of minority populations, to improve performance by implementing a performance management system and improving organizational culture, and five, to, a, to prevent addiction and address <coughs> the opioid crisis. She is board certified in pediatrics, and she has had distinguished positions even before she took this one, including uh, working for the United States Surgeon General in Washington, D.C. So as soon as um, everybody's seated from getting food, Dr. Rattay can begin. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here today, and truly an honor to get to be here. And while I look through my slides, I want to introduce a couple of people on my team. Um, we've got Cassandra Coates Johnson in the front, who's uh, director of the Clean Health for DPH, and also Becky King, who is our public health nursing director. And who, anybody else from public health? Can you raise your hand? Great. Oh, okay. Leah, I didn't see you. Leah Woodall is uh, director of our family health systems, and other folks are here. We're all here as a resource for you if you want to. Uh, talk to us about public health and, and health policy later on. So keep um, keep our folks in mind. Um, who are our students here at Dell State University? Uh, you are amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. I hope that this is informative for you all today. And um, who else faculty here? Awesome. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, to be part of this discussion. And so, are you going to click for me? I am going to click for you. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so here's some of the things I'm going to cover. Um, I, I want to talk about first, what are the most important determinants of our health? And it may not be what you, what you think it is. Um, I also want to talk about why are some people less healthy than others. And then we're going to talk about the value of a policy in addressing these inequities. And what is important to know about health policy? We'll just touch on that one, but I wanted to, to share a couple things from, from my perspective. Next slide, please. So, you know, when a lot of people think about health, they think about health care. Pretty much everybody goes to health care. It's health care that's what's so important for our health. And it is. It's about 10% of what determines you know, how healthy we are, how we access Um, of course, genetics um, are important, uh, and that includes constitutional issues, such as are they male or female, and you know, what, is, what is the DNA in the type of us um, like. Um, and uh, so, of course, genetics are a factor. And then, of course, what we choose to do as far as, you know, are we, do we make healthy choices? Do we eat healthy? Do we, you know, are we tobacco free? Are we physically active? Um, those are, you know, clearly very, very important factors for whether we are healthy. But you can see there's a big chunk missing here, right? So what's that other 50% you know, or so? The next slide, please. Things that <coughs> a lot of people haven't really thought as much about, but it's it's really our social context, our um, meaning, you know, what are the people around us doing? Do we have support, social support, to make healthy choices? And what is our environment like around us? Do we have access to healthy foods? Is it safe to go outside? Is it safe for the children to walk from the bus stop home? Um, do, is there um, adequate access to jobs? Do they pay a little 
now understand are so much more important for our health than we've ever really given them credit for. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, we, we have been using the term health equity uh, a lot over you know, the last decade or so. And it's a term that is confusing to lots of people. Um, but it's really important to, for people to understand that the reality is not everybody has equal access to being healthy. And so it's not all just about equally dividing resources, because the reality is, you know, for some folks, the system has already put them in a position where the same amount of resources aren't going to help them get the apple. And so when we think about equity, we're thinking about addressing whether it's unfairness or injustices to make sure that everybody has equal opportunities for optimal health. Next slide, please. And we know that that is not the case right now. So just this geographic map of Delaware, which looks at life expectancy, shows us that you know, if you look at the darkest areas, that's where people are not living as longer. And if you look at the lightest areas, uh, people are living about seven years longer compared to those darker areas. We also have a similar slide on another important indicator of health um, in infant mortality. And we also see uh, a very, very similar map. So we have you know, some pretty consistent areas in our state where we are seeing poor health outcomes, whether it's infant mortality or some of the risk factors we look at, diabetes. You know, we, we see um, some of the same patterns geographically. Next slide, please. So this is a slide I, I uh, stole from Robert Wood Johnson a few years ago, which I love, because I think it really depicts so beautifully how important a community environment is. So whether we, where we live, where we learn, where we pray, where we play, where we work, all of those settings have a really important impact on how healthy we are going to be. And so, you know, you get some people with a perspective that it's all about personal choices, right? Pointing the finger. It's all about, you know, this person just exercised like I told them to, or ate more fruits and vegetables like I said, they would be healthier. And the reality is there are many barriers and obstacles that some people face <laughs> that are not equally faced uh, across all. And that might be based on gender, it might be, um, uh, we see differences uh, by race and ethnicity. We see differences uh, by disability status. And um, we also see some pretty significant differences for um, people who are part of the LGBTQ population where we see um, uh, worse health outcomes. But uh, we, we definitely, uh, there are definitely system barriers in, the place, in, in, in place that make it harder to be healthier. There's this uh, one researcher in, um, uh, from North Carolina has, who's been doing some work. He calls it John Henryism. I don't know if, if folks that here have heard of this. Did you know John Henry? Do you remember the story of John Henry who was um, tasked with building a, a railroad track and he kept getting more and more pressure to go faster and faster and faster and he, and he kept proving himself and he, um, it's kind of like a picking your up from the, up from the, your bootstraps kind of approach where he just kept proving and proving that he, he could get this done and then die. And what uh, this theory has been has translated into some research and looking at, you know, folks who beat the odds and, you know, achieve great outcomes, there is a health risk to that actually because there's so much stress associated with making it over some of these hurdles, then um, that can actually lead to some poor health outcomes. Next slide. So it's a lot more complicated than just pointing a finger at somebody and saying, take this medicine or eat healthy. So this is a, a socio-ecological model, and we use this a lot in public health. And this green layer of the 
the rainbow is the layer that we're really starting to focus a lot more of our attention on, recognizing that it is those things like, do I have a job? Is it safe? And is it giving me things like, you know, paid family leave? Uh, do my children have access to early childhood education or other quality education? Um, do I have safe water to drink? Do I, you know, what is our house like? Um, is it safe? Is, our, is there violence in our community? And agriculturally, you know, do, um, well, not just agriculture, but food access. Do, do I have a place to go where I can even buy fruits and vegetables? Next slide, please. So this is Dr. Tom Frieden. He was the director for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and he created this pyramid, um, which you know, many of us have embraced. And this is, you know, at the top there of the pyramid, um, these are your more um, resource-intensive efforts. So, you know, the healthcare system, it's education in the healthcare system or in other places to tell people, you know, how you can be healthier. And so those things can make a difference, but they're very resource-intensive, very expensive, and you don't have an impact on a whole population. When, um, uh, when you're doing one-to-one -one kinds of interventions. When you're at the bottom of the pyramid and you're focusing on the economic conditions and the social conditions or the environments in which people live, you're going to hear more, um, I'm happy to say, from James Wilson about things like individual and access to trails. So, you know, if you cross the, the street safely, those things matter. And um, so, Public health is finding itself at the bottom of this pyramid much, much more so now. Next slide, please. Um, so if you look back over the last century or so, um, a lot of our greatest public health achievements are really had a policy or an environmental or system focus. So not, you know, healthcare focus, but if you look at vaccination, what made the most difference? Developing systems of them to vaccinate, um, uh, to develop a safety net systems, so the vaccine for children program, uh, control of infectious diseases, things like, oh, you can't hear me. I'm sorry, I was not listening well to your, your signals. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, when you go to a restaurant, was food handled safely? Or is, are, is there, are there infectious diseases in the water that you drink? Or the, pool, uh, the pools that you swim in? Those are huge strides that we've made over the last century. Um, tobacco control, some of the most powerful approaches to tobacco control has not been you know, making the cessation devices available in the clinical setting. It's been things like the Clean Indoor Air Act, or taxing tobacco, uh, those have been the most powerful drivers to influence whether people are are smoking. Motor vehicle safety, so, you know, improving the vehicle themselves or using seatbelts. Those are you know some of the most powerful um, ways in which we've improved health outcomes. So that's kind of a, I'm trying to give you now to shift to a little bit of a flavor of kind of the, the broader policy approaches that can make a, a bigger impact. So we all see ourselves in what we now call public health 3.0. So 1.0 was when we were really focused on sanitation and infectious disease control. Public health 2.0 um, had a, a strong focus on chronic disease prevention and control, which remains incredibly important for us. But now we realize, given our understanding of what really determines health, is that solutions to improve health are going to require focusing very differently on those environmental issues and the broader, um, the broader systems that are influencing our health. And that means working with different people than we've, we've worked with before. So that means you know, public health working with transportation folks and um, with our, our friends in agriculture and, and uh, d doing you know, really strong faith-based partnerships. Um, it's, you know, it's really looking at how are we going to really get into the community and help improve health outcomes 
in their communities. Next slide, please. So for public health, we, we think about this term a lot, but we, we can't just stay in our public health swim lanes anymore. We, we need to be at different tables with different people where we're really focusing on those different determinants of health. Next slide, please. So health and all policies is something you're going to hear more about, but it's something that we really embrace. And it really, in a nutshell, it's thinking about how any policy is going to help, is going to affect the health of people. And also it's thinking about, is it going to affect the health of people in an unjust or an unfair way? And um, it's, a, it's a different lens for a lot of people now, but more and more we are hearing you know, people who are thinking about transportation policies and others thinking about it from a health lens. But we have a lot more to do to get this to become the way in which everyone does their business. So it is not, there's not a recipe to health in all policies. You know, a number of us have done some health impact assessments in communities and looked at policies and, and uh, tried to figure out the impact it would have on health. There's actually a methodology to that, which is, which is great. For health in all policies, it's not quite as simple because there's many ways to get to your um, your endpoint of improving uh, of improving health and, and the conditions which impact health. So we think about it as an approach or a process. It's a philosophy in which you know, you're always thinking about the health impact of decisions that are made and really thinking upstream, we call it. So trying to get to the root causes of, of poor health outcomes um, rather than um, directly you know, helping somebody who's already very sick. Next slide, please. So when you think about health policies, now we are thinking more about agricultural policy, um, you know, our, you know, farm to school or farm to child care. Those are examples of, of um, strides forward that our agricultural agency here in the state has, has um, moved forward on education policy. I mean, do, um, that's that we have access to uh, high quality early childhood education and we know that education looks different in different parts of our um, of our state unfortunately are we addressing that are we putting more resources into the communities where we're not seeing as good of educational outcomes economic policies such as you know minimum wage just you know a lot of people are working for a wage that's not a livable wage Criminal justice policy, we know that uh, there are inequities um, in, uh, in our criminal justice system. We know that, that black men are more likely to be imprisoned than white men for the same crime. That needs to be fixed because it, is, it has a dramatic impact on health. Um, and others, land use, tax policy, transportation policy, these are all policies where public health is now starting to find itself having a role in. So this is um, a health equity guide, and it was uh, co-written by Cassandra Coates Johnson, who's here in the room, and another colleague of ours, Erin Knight, who's at the University of Delaware. I love this guide, and I want to encourage you all to, um, if you just Google Delaware Health Equity Guide, you'll get to this guide. It has tremendous information that goes into much more detail about what I've been talking about, but also how do you start to you know, galvanize a community? How do you get a community to really start thinking about these policies, these, um, uh, these uh, this health and all policy approach to make it real. Um, so please take a look and also let us know if you want some support for um, uh, your uh, groups in uh, starting to think about how you might do things differently. Um, so around policy, you know, let, sometimes advocacy and policy are, are confused. Um, advocacy is incredibly important and it's really the application of information and resources to help change policy, but what policy is, and, and to be honest, I wish when I was a student in college, I had some idea what policy was, but I really had no clue. Um, and 
now that I have a better understanding, I mean, certain, a lot of people, when they think of policy, they do think of laws. So you might think of federal laws, or you might think of state laws, or local laws and regulations. And certainly, that's policy. A lot of people call, consider that big policy. But there's also then uh, what some people call smaller policies, which are just, you know, um, whether it's a church or um, a, a school or any organization that might put their own policies in place um, uh, where they can influence, for example, you know, what foods might be available. I'm using that as an example. Um, you know, a lot of smaller policies uh, can make a tremendous impact as well. Next slide, please. So when we think about policy, I have to tell you, when I uh, was a, you know, a budding epidemiologist who found myself in the public health world, um, I remember sitting with the Surgeon General at this meeting and we were talking about physical activity in schools. And I spent a lot of time with the research and the science, and so I knew that science. And the conversation was going in a direction that really, I, I was like, but well, that's not what the science says, or the science doesn't really support that. And I, um, I remember making a comment, and I think folks looked at me like I had three heads. And what I learned early on, the science is incredibly important, so please don't get me wrong, but it's not the only thing. And so when we want to change policy, we have to start thinking you know, much broader than just what the scientific evidence tells us. We have to think about the stories, individual stories, we also have to think about the politics of the time. So for example, if a governor or another elected official says, I'm not going to raise taxes, probably a soft drink tax uh, bill isn't going to go too far. Um, ethics, you got to think about the impact it's gonna, um, that policies are going to have. Is it going to be an un unjust or unequal policy? Or you know, pri is privacy going to be violated? Economics. I've been in this position for eight years, and I can tell you any you know any policy that's going to have we call it a fiscal note, but a price tag tied to it isn't going to get anywhere. Um, and also, you've got to think about what laws are in place and, and is what you're proposing in violation with, for example, a federal law. Next slide, please. So, wow, I can't even read this. No way you can read this, right? Uh, but um, I want to point out um, that this is. A comes from an article written by Ross Brownson, which I, I, some folks in this room know. And it really, um, really makes me think about the different barriers that there are to policy. And, and, and it's really important when you think about policy that you kind of step back and have the different lenses and realize that not everybody comes to the table with the same perspective. So uh, James and I were just talking a lot of times, uh, when you bring the health the health argument to the table, that's not where a lot of people are. A lot of people are thinking about the economics, and um, uh, you know, a lot of people don't really have much value on prevention. Uh, so, from our perspective, we think prevention is everything. But there's only about five percent of, of all healthcare and, and public health dollars go into prevention. Uh, it's not well funded at all and, and you know I'd love to change that but the reality is it's hard because it's hard to show a benefit of, of prevention and we got to keep plugging away we got to find good stories and, and uh, um, <coughs> help people differently also often there's not a good evidence base and especially around health policy there's not it's not real well studied um, you know mismatched time horizons a lot of legislators are looking at two years or four years. And, they, and when you're talking about budget, they're looking at one year. So if, if you can't show a savings for something in one year, you're going to have you know, not a good budget argument to make uh, with those who are deciding our budget. So you know, it's important to keep that in mind. Also, is it an election year? That's going to affect you know, how people respond at times. Um, vested in interest. I want to mention this because um, I, I, I'm personally pretty idealistic and it, it still surprises me that the tobacco industry and the beverage industry and others are so powerful. But that is the reality. They are. And we, um, you know, we come up against them a lot and we just have to recognize it and, and um, be very proactive and try to get up in front 
of um, the arguments that they may make, but the reality is they, they are pretty effective at getting a lot of people on their side, and, and uh, that's why uh, they've had so much influence on policy decisions. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but policy making is, is, is really messy, and it's really complicated, and Oftentimes, it does not happen quickly, and oftentimes, it's not the policy that you wanted at the end. And so, oftentimes, we see ourselves satisfied with just making progress forward, and sometimes, just getting something to move is good enough if you if you feel you're headed in the right direction. Um, lots of groups can be very effective in moving policy forward. Coalitions are effective because they can you know, get the argument uh, together and you know, powerfully knock on the doors of a lot of legislators and, um, and help them think differently about a policy. Um, community groups can be very powerful. I'm sure James has some stories. Like, you know, a lot of people, community groups can work both ways for you. So, um, but when it comes to trails, a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't want that in my backyard. Um, we saw in, in Newark how powerful a community group was to uh, get the data center filled. So, um, community groups can be very powerful. Health provider organizations also provide um, a very important voice uh, by creating position statements often. That's, uh, you know, we carry those around with us. Um, legislators, of course, are very important for, for policy making, and it's important to develop relationships with them, to, and to also to understand that they may not always uh, be able to support your initiative or support it right now. That doesn't mean they're bad people. Um, although some of them aren't very nice, but most of them are. Um, academicians um, are very important in helping us to, you know, get um, uh, do the research and also, you know, can really help us to uh, bring the research, to, you know, into one place and, and also can help lobby. So the most powerful advocates I have ever seen are the victims themselves. And uh, the most powerful, some of the most powerful advocacy I've seen here in Delaware is around this addiction epidemic because families who have lost loved ones are, um, you know, they're, they're telling stories and they're, ma and they're making changes and legislators are listening to the recommendations they are, they are making because um, because they have an understanding of what's going on and what the barriers have been for their families. And so although it can be incredibly painful for victims, it can also be um, very rewarding for victims to, uh, uh, to help change the system. So um, it takes all those folks off to make policy difference. So in summary, what are the most significant determinants of our health? The social determinants, we call them. Next slide. Why are some people less healthy than others? It's not a level playing field right now for a lot of, a lot of people. And so while we strive for health, health equity, we've got a lot more work to do. What is the value of policy in addressing these equities? It is one of the most powerful levers we have to make changes that will impact health of people. So what is important to know about health policy? It is a valid discipline in its own right, and there are, you know, there's a lot of good information out there about how you can do health policy well. Um, yeah, you have to put yourself in different people's shoes as you're thinking through health policy. Um, we need more evidence base around policies, and it requires advocacy. So I really want to thank you all for inviting me here and for your attention. And I'm sorry that I have to leave, but Cassandra Coast Johnson uh, will do a, a great job answering questions around health equity and health policy later on. In the thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's join me in thanking Dr. Rotanian for a So quick housekeeping, if you haven't had lunch, please feel free to go to the table and get a, get a box. 
Um, I'm going to um, do the introductions of the remaining speakers, and then James will be next. Um, and then after James is done, if the speakers would come up after him in the order they appear in the agenda, and then when they're all done, if you would all come to the stage and take a seat, and we will do audience interaction, and we'll take your questions of them um, after we're all done. So I'll introduce all of them, they'll all speak in turn, and then they'll all come up to the stage and take your questions. So our next speaker is James Wilson, who is the Executive Director of Bike Delaware. He's a member of the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals, and um, he has served on advisory committees on advisory councils on mobility and pedestrian awareness. He holds engineering degrees from Yale and the University of Texas, and um, he has helped to make Delaware uh, a more bike-friendly state. It is now a number three bicycle-friendly state in America. Uh, after him will be Mary Ellen Gray, um, who will introduce um, her colleague. Um, Mary Ellen has 25 years of professional experience working at the local, state, and federal level in regulatory and planning fields. She has worked for the state of Indiana in environmental management and water quality, and um, she has also worked for rural places and um, places that are not urban or federal or state. And she holds a geology degree from the University of Rochester, New York, and a master's of planning from UEA. Um, then we have Dr. Goldie Howard Osbe, who is um, homegrown. She's here at Delaware State. She's a professor and extension specialist of natural resources at the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources here at Delaware State. Um, her PhD is in fisheries and allied aquacultures. And so she um, has served on advisory committees for NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and has served um, in other advisory committees and has done the work funded by grants from the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and does uh, climate change work as well. So after that, I will speak, and then all of us will be here taking your questions. So without further ado, James, thank you. So, I don't know if you remember Dr. Rotate's last slide. The very, very last word of her uh, presentation was advocacy. And that's uh, it would be a better introduction by Delaware. Uh, that's what we do. We are policy advocates. We don't, uh, uh, we don't run any rides. We don't, uh, uh, we don't do any programs of any kind. Uh, we are completely focused on policy. So. I've got a dozen slides, I'm going to run through too quickly, uh, but if I could just get your attention and have you have one takeaway from the whole talk, it would be this, this slide, and, and, and would, would you go back to it? Right. Yeah, just the, the title really would be a takeaway that I want you to go away with, which is that transportation policy is really important to health policy, really important, and it is health policy. Um, and it's its own thing, right? It, you can't, um, you can't just, uh, you, I mean, it has its own language. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's as ridiculous for, um, you know, to expect that, say, someone who knows a lot about infectious diseases uh, could do transportation policy as it would be for an engineer to come and start talking about viruses and, and all the kinds of things that are really policy. So it's its own thing. So that's that's a takeaway that I, I'd like you all to, to get out of this if you get nothing else. Next slide. So you probably have heard these quotes in some, you know, some you know or versions of them, you know, that physical activity is really important. That if it was a drug, if it was a pharmaceutical, it would be the most valuable pharmaceutical ever developed. If you could turn the health benefits of physical activity into a pill, you would be wealthier than Warren Buffett and Bill Gates put together. I mean, the, the value of that is was just incomparable. Uh, and, and, and I'll just talk a little bit more to where that conclusion comes from. Next slide. So the World Health Organization has looked at literally decades of research about public health and uh, the where they come down is that about a quarter of all breast cancers and colon cancers are tied to physical inactivity. 
uh, over a quarter of diabetes, physical inactivity, and, and almost a third of, of, of heart disease, again, tied to physical inactivity. So it's, it's, if you remember Dr. Rutte's slide, it's, you know, it's far more important than medical care, it's more important than genetics, it's, it's huge. Next slide. The Centers for Disease Control has a uh, recommended strategies for increasing physical activity, and here you see them all. And a lot of them are at the, remember the, uh, the pyramid that Dr. Rutte had? You know, that, that got, you know, a lot of them are up at the top of the pyramid. They're resource intensive, they're, they're targeted. As you go down that list, it's sort of, it's not shaped like a pyramid, but it's kind of like that pyramid, but the, the, the ones at the bottom are more population-wide ones. Next slide. And, and you'll see something about these one about these these ones that are population wide. You know, they are. Next slide. They're all transportation related, transportation and land use. You know, those, those are the policies that the Centers for Disease Control have really identified as being both effective and population wide. They're all transportation and land use policies. That's that's big, right? I mean, you know, go back to Dr. Rattay's. Uh, swimming lanes, right? It's just like, you know, if you're interested in public health, you have to get out of our lane. Well, one of those lanes is really big. <laughs> this lane is really, really big. Next slide. <clears throat> so here's kind of what we're getting with our current transportation policies. This is, uh, you know, familiar. You know, this is the this is what we've been doing since World War II. This is the kind, these are the kind of communities, this is the, this is the built environment that we've been creating. I mean, how many of you live in you know, a place that looks like this, where you live in a, a neighborhood and it's just all houses, acres and acres and acres of houses, and if you want to go and get a quart of milk, can, how many people can walk to get a quart of milk? How many people can't? So more and more, the, the built environment that we're creating in, in, in the United States and Delaware is not set up for you to walk to, for your kids to walk to school, for you to be able to bicycle to work, to be able to get a, just basic groceries, you've got to get in your car. Single-use subdivisions, shopping malls, office parks. Does anybody else find it ironic that we call these places where there are all these office buildings office parks? Is that because you park there, as opposed to being like a place that has like Trees. Um, so, does anybody? So, look, look at all that stuff up there. Look at all those weird words. The zoning for both MUTCD. Does that, has anybody in this room ever heard of the MUTCD or the or KSI or the TIP TIP? Anybody? Something right there. A couple of folks. So, so getting involved in transportation policy without knowing that language is like getting, like, you know, you're, that you're really passionate about infectious disease policy and you go to a bunch of meetings and, and, you, and all these people are talking about, like, viruses. And you're like, what, what is a virus? You know, that's just not, you know, that's, this is the basic language of transportation policy. It's actually, so, so that's discouraging, right, that you don't know and, uh, this language. Here's the encouraging part, though. It's actually simpler, I think, than a lot of health policy. You know, the MUTCD, when you find out what it is, it's just a manual. It's way simpler than, you know, understanding how viruses work. It's much, much simpler. So the discouraging thing is it, it's its own thing. It's its own, it requires its own expertise. The thing I want to say that's encouraging is it's actually not that bad once you get into it. So here in Delaware, you know, so street scale urban design, these, again, Centers for Disease Control Strategies, population, you know, ones that are, have been shown to be effective and affect population on a wide scale. We, in, here in Delaware, we wanted to put all of these policies into the law simultaneously because they all, they're synergistic, they work together. Street design, community scale urban design, land use policies, so important. Uh, you know, transport to school. And the way we did that 
was the, act of, the Healthy Transit Friendly Development Act. Next slide. There'll be another slide here in just a moment where I talk briefly about it, but I just want you to know that we, uh, we passed it. This is now state law. That's Governor Markell. The, the uh, uh, act was signed into, into law. This is now state law in Delaware. Next slide. Without getting into too many details, here's the, here's the crux of it. There are two completely independent parts of government that need to be on the same page in order for us to have a better built environment, a healthier built environment. You need land use, policies and regulations, and you need transportation investments, and they need to be coordinated. They need to all be going in the same direction. And here in Delaware, transportation money and funding and policy is completely controlled by the state government. But land use regulation, zoning, all that stuff, totally uncontrolled by the state government. It's all controlled by a local government. So what the Healthy and Transit Friendly Development Act does at its essence is it creates a, a mechanism, a structure to get the state and local governments working together, coordinated, so we can have appropriate land use regulation and zoning and multimodal transportation investments that are complementary with each other. Next slide. You're never going to remember this slide, but those are, these are the different pieces of the Healthy and Transit Friendly Development Act. Transit appropriate zoning, no minimum parking regulations, required multimodal investments, slow streets, slow streets, that's important, and uh, getting away from this idea of just we're going to just build roads, and, and, you know, because that's inimical, to, in, that's antithetical to making communities that are walkable and bikeable. Next slide. I don't have time to explain how the Healthy and Transit Friendly Development Act works, but if you are interested in this, on May 4th, our annual summit will be here in Dover, just a mile away, uh, completely free. These, there's some cards on the front table. Uh, if you're interested in this policy area, come to the summit. You can learn the whole summit is completely about implementing this new law. Next slide. And I believe Dr. Taylor mentioned uh, you know, uh, you know, some of you might be thinking about your future. So, um, uh, I'll say this: if you are interested in graduate programs in health policy, you won't learn about transportation policy. That's just that's just a fact. Um, as far as I know, there are no graduate programs in health policy where you'll learn what the MUTCD is and transport traffic impact studies and and you know the whole panoply of transportation policy. However, if you're interested. Uh, come see me later because we are hiring and you could come work for us and learn all lot. Well, hello everyone. I'm Ariel and Gray. I'm the Assistant Planning Director for Kane County. And with me today is also our Director for uh, Planning in Kane County, Sarah Cooper. Um, to help move things along, where I'm just going to give the whole presentation. Um, is anybody else besides Sarah and I planning? Okay. All right. So, uh, Dr. Ate and um, and uh, Mr. Wilson talked a lot about land use, and transportation, and uh, housing, and environment, and how it all affects health. And uh, so, I want to talk to, uh, for a couple of minutes here about um, how land use policy is done at the local level. As James uh, commented, is up on that issue is that land use, uh, excuse me, that yeah, land use is done at the local level. And then I also want to talk about a you know, project that we, myself and some other colleagues uh, throughout the state, have been working on regarding trying to marriage uh, land use policy and, and health and how we move forward on healthy eating and active living. So I have a couple of slides here. Um, can we go back to the, the first? Thank you. Land use policy. Um, as was mentioned, the land use policy is shaped by federal law but, and is enabled by state, state uh, statute and policy, and, but then it's done at the local level. And how that is done is by uh, policies that shape through what we, call, what we call the comprehensive plan, which is which we're currently working on now. If you have a moment, um, when you're at your computer, just Google Ken County Comprehensive Plan. And you'll see we are currently working on an update 
for our comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan is a master plan of how we're going to live, work, and play, you heard those words uh, this morning, on, in, in Kent County. And those, it, it contains all sorts of uh, issues and policies on and how we do that. Also, um, from the policy, then, when, then we implement ordinances, and that's the actual land use law, uh, how things are zoned, um, the size of lots, what uses can be used in different places. And those are all shaped a lot, and you've heard this before, I'm gonna repeat this a couple more times throughout this brief pre presentation, is public input. Policy is shaped by who comes to the table. And can the influence be shaped not by only who comes to the table, but our, our times and our uh, culture as well. Dr. Adetay so probably uh, talked about uh, policy being right. And um, sometimes it's not always right to be discussed, but it needs to be, or it need, not, uh, not right to be implemented, but needs to be discussed and put on the table and, and discussed with your decision makers, which I'll get to in a moment. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, land use policy change. How is that done at the local level? I mentioned the comprehensive plan, and uh, there are a couple pictures here. One is to try to, because people like comprehensive plan, what the heck is that? Um, so what we've done is try to do some messaging here, and we, uh, since it, we're an agricultural area, and chicken is king here, um, we have adopted a mascot called Veggie the Rooster, which is in the lower left. <laughs> And uh, we have it, you know, so blessed that we have an um, in house artist who well, he, he does art on the side, he doesn't do art for us, but he do, does do art for us. And then we managed to get a mascot. So we have a mascot, and that is, and if you do Google him, um, you, um, you know, what is it called? Instagram? Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, Instagram, is, yeah, I'm not a millennial, I'm sorry. I, um, we, we have people who are, so they do these things for us. Um, so we, uh, we have an uh, Instagram account called Where's Reggie throughout the county to try to get people engaged and to get on our site and to give us input on how they want to live, work, and play in Kent County. Um, and this over here is an illustration of how our land use policy has shaped how we, how we live, work, and play in Kent County. The lines on the outside, the, the gray lines, are what's called our growth zone. And we have land use policies that encourage development within that area. And, if you can, and the, um, the colored uh, spots are uh, subdivisions. The ones in the yellow are the ones that are currently being built. For, excuse me, the ones, um, those are um, not, are, are approved but not being built on. The ones in the red have been what's called expunged. They haven't been built upon. And uh, we have a law that says that when the development isn't going forward, it, it, um, no longer. And then the green are the ones that are being developed. And if you can see our land use policies in Kent County have pretty much focused on uh, development within the growth zone. And that's so important when we're talking about healthy eating and active living because when we concentrate development in certain areas around existing developments, that enables other activities such as likable, walkable communities. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to talk a couple minutes about our Plan for Health grant. This is a grant through the Centers for Disease Control, um, and funding through the Centers for Disease Control, and um, we had a partner with the American Planning Association, which I'm a member, every, every group has, a, has an association, and the American Public Health Association, that's how I met uh, Cassandra and her team. Um, and we are working to, a requirement of this is to work together and form a, a team to look at how we can improve healthy eating and active living uh, first in Kent County, and then we get a second follow-up grant, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, on how we can take that model and uh, apply it throughout the state. So the purpose of this grant is to improve the health of the citizens of Kent County. We've heard this term uh, this morning, or this afternoon now, is looking at planning through the lens of health. And we've never done that before. And uh, so we're learning a whole new language in the world of health because half of our team is in the health field. And frankly, we've never collaborated like this before. And we learn a whole lot from each other on how we can incorporate healthy eating and active living um, in the county. Next slide. Okay, so the project, and this project is coming to a conclusion. 
And uh, we did health equity mapping. You all know what that is since you're in the health field. We're looking at uh, social determinants of health and where those uh, social determinants are pointing us towards whether there is health inequities in our community. We also did a health survey of King County residents. And we did a three-day meeting of uh, what's called charrette, which is like a doing a plan on steroids. It's a three-day uh, workshop of uh, public outreach and meetings to try to get um, input from the public and from other stakeholders on uh, how we can improve healthy eating and active living in Kent County. And then ultimately, we're going to uh, develop Christian Hudson and Mark's on as a guidance document for our comprehensive plan. Okay. Okay, so the survey results, uh, no surprise here on our, our results of that sampling of 500 residents, uh, people not eating their vegetables. And keep in mind that people are, are answering these questions on the phone. So, um, you know, I don't know about you, but I tend to inflate, you know, that I'm really healthier than I am. And, and uh, so, uh, so people actually do. You know, like um, the average result was one vegetable a day. Um, and they have to drive three miles, to, more than three miles to a store. They have limited uh, walkable and bikeable destinations. Uh, traffic safety is a concern. And most do not live close enough to walk to their parks, and there are enough parks. Next slide. So the charrette findings, um, and, and we have, I, I could talk like an hour on this, so, but feel yourself blessed that I'm not going to. <laughs> but um, if, if you want, you just Google Delaware Plan for Health, and we have all, all our data online, should you want to do a deeper dive into this. Um, but our short findings is that uh, convenience stores for health food access are the go-to option for, for some people. And we need to bring healthy foods into the neighborhoods. And we have a couple of thoughts on how to do that. And with active transportation, even though there are sidewalks, there are gaps and barriers, and there aren't uh, enough connections. We have isolated areas where people can bike and walk, but we don't have connections to make that happen. And as I mentioned, there are enough uh, parks in our neighborhoods, and we don't have links to the existing parks. Next slide. So um, moving on to the comprehensive plan guidance. As I mentioned, we are, uh, Kent County is looking to uh, update our, our comprehensive plan, which is our master plan on how we're going with work and plan in Kent County. So the core principles that we're trying to incorporate um, help into, uh, into our comprehensive plan it's looking at developing healthy food environments, encouraging economic opportunity. We've heard that mentioned by Dr. Arate this morning. Uh, enhanced mobility, improve access to healthy foods, uh, promote health and, and equity, and promote physical activity um, and active transportation. Next slide. So uh, the recommendations um, for uh, that group will be incorporated into our comprehensive plan for uh, healthy eating and active living to include healthy data. And I'm not going to go through all these, but, but the takeaway is to use the data that we gather, not only through our survey and our work, but also through our collaboration with our health partners here in the state um, to, to make the point that we really do need to do something. And, and, there, and there are certain things that we can do. We could promote shared use and adaptive use of uh, public health property for community use, explore healthy food zones. There are lots of, uh, of options that we're looking at is to try to bring people to healthy food and try to bring healthy food to people and to get them out and create communities where people are going to be uh, more active. Next slide. Um, and these are the uh, final set of recommendations here. Um, include active design elements that encourage walking and biking. But the, the real takeaway for that, for, for Kent County, is we have a lot of opportunities for, for people to connect in our communities, but um, we need to prioritize them and see how we can make those links work with existing infrastructure. So you know, we don't have a big budget, but we have some budget, and we have some uh, great working relationship with the NPO and with, with DELDOT to try to uh, make those links happen. So our next steps is, our, I mentioned our, our, our Planners for Health grant, is uh, to fully integrate planning and public health at the APA's American Planning Association and to drill that down into local land use uh, organizations such as Kent County. And to take that 
and to uh, take that state line and to collaborate with our partners um, in health and in transportation and housing as well to see how we can use what our current programs that we're doing now and how we can leverage those resources and work together and move forward to move the needle uh, on, on healthy eating. Okay, in summary, uh, for both from a land use policy and health policy standpoint, to affect policy change, you need to be informed, you need to be engaged, um, and collaborate when you can because you are stronger together. If, if you can get with some other groups of like-minded people and leverage those resources, you are so much stronger and have a bigger voice. You need to get involved, and most importantly, you need to show up. You need to show up to your local meetings, your local county council, city council meetings. You need to get to know your county and city commissioners. You need to get to know your mayors. And you need to have that dialogue and say, I want to be heard. And, and then listen. And they might not do things the right away, but, uh, but it, it, it's, it's a long ride. But I, I think it's worth, worth, uh, worth doing. It's worth the endeavor. So that concludes my Resources program. I'd like to talk about um, what uh, Dr. Rafi uh, mentioned about uh, earlier policies and you know how, and also or, or speaker next after him and how the uh, environment affects uh, health. So, and uh, I am focusing on water because I am a water scientist myself and I have a program of drinking water, a uh, quality program. Um, I, so public education is really important because we are mostly drivers for um, poor or um, I, the community leaders to and participate in the decision making. There are a lot of actually hearings and uh, meetings going on and many of us are actually probably hear about them but we don't participate as much as we should. Um, so there are a lot of decisions are being made, and uh, or as or speakers prior to me mentioned, we need to be at the table. We might not be invited every meetings, but there are hearings we need to participate. And so there ha everything is very connected. Again, we have this beautiful slide how everything else is very strongly linked with each other. So you drink wrong water, you got sick, you got to the, you know, basically it affects overall your performance and then your immune system gets down. And if you are pregnant, it even affects your child. And if there is a chain reaction, it's really cascading the effects. So if you have a wrong start, that one way or another, you need to correct that course somewhere. You need to make some changes. So the best, one of the best changes is that not only think about things, do something. It's like I keep telling today I was teaching the class and I told the student, okay, so you agree with me, what are you going to do about this? So, the next slide, please. Um, and so, again, our speaker mentioned about advocacy. Okay, great, you know, if there are times I am activist, there are times I am just right at the policy table with um, our leaders, you know, community leaders and such. But the thing is that there has to be a way that we communicate ourselves. If something is wrong for me, it's mostly wrong for other people. Like, who wants to drink the water from Philip Mission? So, uh, let's go back to the overall, why is this so important? Um, it is basically, uh, just to concentrate on environment, the policy is the decision making basically is refers to the action taken within the government of Paris to formulate, adapt, implement, evaluate or change environmental policy that affects overall environmental quality and us, human health. And so there is a link to it. If they are to share the slides, we wanted to make sure you have the link for it. Okay, so policy making is very complicated. I heard 
And I have been in a couple of them. I am just the side person. I didn't even make any decision. I was just, you know, being an expert in providing. So what does it tell you? It starts somewhere. There is some planning going on, but you, you don't always get what you ask for. So here is the little um, cartoon here. You, you want both? Come on, get serious. We can only afford one, the clean air or clean water. You've got to pick one. So this is it. Economy is a driver. Really the driver. It's like one way or another. Everybody actually agrees with you, but it's not happening that way. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are a number of them. I won't go through the details, but we do things that hopefully they won't go away. But we do have some policies in place. And like Delaware, as a department, is a small state. A lot of people know each other and sit at the same, you know, same. We actually cross each other in different meetings, in different settings. It's really great. We are able to have that little intimacy, having conversation with people. Many weeks to dates, we don't get to know a lot of people. But in Delaware, we do. So when actually something goes wrong with some neighbors, we hear about it. Somebody's water is wrong, we hear it. It means that somebody needs to do something and take action. So that's a good thing. And so here's a couple of rules. The Clean Water Act was the, the plastic. It started. So it's, uh, there are a lot of them in place. So um, just, you know, if you are very interested in, there are a number of websites from public health to the DENRAC. DENRAC stands for the Department of National, Natural Resources and Environmental Control. It's another agency mainly focusing on the environment. So. Um, we can move to the next slide. And there are many ways contamination happens. So what I want to do here is like, okay, so we talk about the land and what happens to water. Like water, you can't contain the water. When you actually, I don't know like how you will be able to, if there is any toxic materials or any heavy metals get into the water, how are you going to contain this, contain or separate the water from each other? It flows. It's very easy. We talk about bioterrorism. Is not for sick, and if somebody puts something wrong into that water, everybody is affected. It's so fast. So the same thing happens. If somebody contaminates the water from one side, it will flow and spread the rest of the water bodies. And there are many ways. We actually pollute our water with the wastewater. If, if, if the wastewater is not treated right, it's a point, point discharge, that's one way. The other ways are 65% of the contaminants come from non-point discharge. When I say that, it means grow more lawns, agricultural operations. There is no such a, like a de definite points. So we do contribute a lot to the contaminants. Everything that we dealt even like using wrongfully those little uh, screens that they have, they said do not dump any chemical contaminants. I have seen people screen it, I warn people, but it, it, it causes contaminations. It goes down. In the storm ditches, like storm runoffs, it all goes down and meets somewhere and ends up in Delaware Bay and it ends up in the groundwater. A lot of, do anybody knows what is the water sources for drinking? from Del in Delaware, mainly groundwater. And you know what? What is, what is really critical in Delaware? We are very close to the uh, sea. But it's, a, it's a very, very shallow the table. When the water table is very high, it means we are any time there is a surface contamination or water is contaminated very fast. Only place is different is Newcastle because they have a little bit elevations. Mm -hmm. and the peaks. Most of us are really in, in bad shape. If, it, if there is a contamination on the surface water, it gets down very fast. Okay, we can move on. So, um, yeah, to talk, there are uh, toxic, um, stuff, you know, organic water pollution. We talk about this. these are from factories, homes, and farms. So many ways that we actually um, don't realize that all these contaminants end up in the water. We talk about heavy metals, and and the, the problem with heavy metals are that it, it's just even very slight concentration. It's just, 
is toxic. It's like you can't, your body cannot cope with it. This happens in Michigan, Michigan when, and also pharmaceuticals. There are a lot of pharmaceutical products that wrongfully discharge, <coughs> it, it, it affects endocrinology, but basically even sexual maturation in the fish in the water. It later eventually it affects if you happen to mix up with your water that you're drinking. There will be a lot of issues when you, but you know what, one thing about the water, unless it is at high concentration. Water contaminants, it gets into your body, takes time, accumulates. And later on, you see the effects of it. If, if it is a very strong, and then you will see immediate active effects. But many of the contaminants, you don't see it over time. So it is mostly industrial, pharmaceutical, farming related, those organic pollutants. And we talk about petrochemical companies that we have in the northern part of Delaware. So there are a lot of spills and such happening. Um, so here is the, some examples of pollutants that are coming from uh, from lab from the plants, and we are talking about again. It's just it's just the overview. So infants, for instance, consuming in this formula can be getting some of these contaminants through the water, using the water that is contaminated. And the lead-based paints actually it's it's kind of forbidden, right? In some places, lead-based paint, if I am not mistaken. But somehow, we still see some people that where did they get this thing? It's happening. And, um, and there are many different ways people get the lead. It could come from the soil itself. Soil itself will have some lead if there is a release accumulation from the food and we got and dust and soil. And there was a, a article that I have read how the contaminants, air contaminants, move to um, United States from China, and how the all the Sahara Desert, you know, the sand that moves all the way, and the same thing happened with the water when the tsunami hit, or some sort of a uh, disaster happened on the California coast. We saw all the remnants of what comes from Japan. So it is. We are very interconnected. We, we, we are not in isolations. This is the same planet we live on. So we can, uh, this is the next one. All right. Um, I, just briefly with this, um, the lead, uh, lead toxicity is very common. And um, it's basically paint is, if they are exposed. And there are some ways that lead poisoning leads to serious health problems. And you can see in the picture, uh, it will have a lot of uh, developmental stage, uh, also neuro, uh, what is called a overall uh, uh, mental uh, development and such. So we can move on faster on this. And um, chlorine, so the chlorine, Main problem with the chlorine, if we, if we are using the chlorine, especially in winter time, we put the salt on the um, hot highways, right, to melt the ice. Chlorine, actually, that chlorine itself, sodium chloride, it's basically separates in the water. It reacts with the, all the chemicals, actually it causes more toxicity once it reacts in the water. And, we, and what happens is we have basically PCBs, is, is, some of the chemicals itself is not toxic, but once it starts reacting, it is toxic for us. And nitrates, this is actually nutrients poisoning, we call it, especially uh, this causes in the babies. If you have a high nitrate, uh, if anybody's chemistry here, NO2, and concentration, you will have uh, baby in toxicity in, the, in babies, but it's called the uh, blue babies. And this happens in the groundwater. The groundwater is contaminated. Yeah, you can, um, this is actually baby being really blue. There are a couple of really uh, pictures that we could see. There are a couple of incidents happening though. And this is in the past. Okay, so why is education on public policy important? It is important because when you are educated and you can actually know about things, you can voice yourself. And it is, it's just the pulp. Education is the pulp. And but you should speak about things that is right. 
Which I just said. A lot of things are happening. Many of us are criticizing, talking about it, but we don't take action. And by the way, all these hearings that I go in Delaware, especially in Kent County, not everything is about politics. But only six, seven people is in there. Is that we need to be more proactive. So what happened is, uh, okay, this is the next one. Okay. Um, we had a program uh, with, the, with the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and Dr. Sanjita Gupta from Public Health Department. And we actually uh, were, were able to learn about the program that helped risk assessment for the community. So this is basically the benefits. I'm going to tell you the details but in a few minutes. So this is the steps to basically get in and find out in your local area what's going on. You can have or similar cases, what kind of uh, uh, programs that people, citizens participated and voiced themselves. They basically are the driver. You are the driver. So and it is a great support for me to do that first and, and helps with the decision making. Thank you for that. And this is basically the website for this and uh, the link is provided here. And this, um, this program is the Community Focused Exposure and Risk, risk Screening Tool. And uh, you can actually find many cases. In all cases, like Ben Say, which is part of the processing for Pit for Chemicals, northern part of Delaware in Wilmington, we can look at the Ben Say concentration and risk for cancer in that area. So it is going to, you will see how the environmental contaminations are being linked with some of the incidences, health risks that are happening to people in certain areas in Delaware. So, and what we did was uh, we are doing the drinking water quality monitoring. It's the pre-screening, but before a lot of people, although they know we have a public health uh, laboratories like one in Smyrna, we basically tell the people, oh, you are, you are drinking that water. You have to go to the public health lab, get your water tested again. We basically encourage people to go to the public health lab or labs and get their drinking water tested. So we started the programs and funding ran out the last two years, but hopefully we will get back on this. And we have about 100 people attended, most of the elderly population and uh, 60 years and above. And uh, there are a number of things that we tested. It's listed in here. Some of them are um, very important for Delaware because of the iron and the like, Bowers Beach area in the southern part of Delaware. You will see your water is a little bit uh, yellowish, and because of the iron concentration. And so. That's good. Um, in the interest of time, my uh, presentation is going to be short so that we can allow time for you who have been so patient uh, to ask questions. Uh, we are about 20 minutes to two. Um, our official cutoff time is two o'clock, but I'm going to um, ask that if you have the time to stay beyond two and the speakers are willing uh, to continue to engage, uh, please feel free to stay here beyond two o'clock, but that's our official um, end time. Um, I would like to uh, introduce you to a study we're doing about health policy literacy. So uh, the idea is the following, that um, most people do not really understand everything that we have heard in the last two hours. People do not understand why health policy matters to their daily lives. People do not understand why public policy matters to their health. So as a research organization, we were asking the question, well, how much do the communities that we serve know about health policy? So how much communities know about health policy we define as health policy literacy. That is, how literate are you about health policy? So we decided that we'd ask the question and we spoke to some of our research partners and we uh, decided that we would do a study within our, the, the communities that we work. And this is going to be done out of Morgan State University. And we're going to ask this question, how much do these communities know about health policy next step. Um, so health disparities are complicated, and um, you've heard some of this already from previous speakers. Uh, the disparities affect several groups. There are many indicators, and they are multiple and intersecting. That is, there are a lot of them, and they all intertwine and intersect with each other, as we've heard from previous speakers. Next slide. Please. 
That's the first challenge. The second challenge is that it is many times more complicated than some of the other big picture items that we deal with, such as national security, for example. Um, next slide, please. So our, our vision at HBRC is to create empowerment opportunities for all stakeholders, especially community members, to help them learn about health policy and in turn engage the policy sector and the policy process. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the idea there is so that people can understand where these problems that we're trying to solve come from and what kind of policies have been advanced to help solve some of these problems. Next slide, please. So we have academic partners to do this study. If you are interested in learning more, there'll be a, uh, an email address that you can email us and to find out more. Next slide, please. Um, and these would be the goals. So we develop a questionnaire that will help to measure what stakeholders know about health disparities and health policy. And then we'll, we're hoping to create some kind of an index that will show, okay, this community knows this much, this community knows this much, this community knows this much. Um, and then we would use that to inform health policy, literacy, education, and training efforts. Next slide, please. So the, the, the participants will come from two areas in Baltimore, and we are hoping to, the, that this, pro, this process will get underway. Our partners at Morgan State are already actively um, building the, the, the framework for this. Next slide. And these are the inclusion criteria. These, this is what we hope the population, the study population, will look like. Next slide, please. And these will be the key questions. What do community members and local policymakers know? Within the context of the social determinants that Dr. Rete talked about, um, what do they know? What do these community know, members know about health disparities? Um, what do they do with this knowledge once they get it? Does this vary across age? Does it vary across ethnicity and gender and educational attainment? Um, and what is the relationship between the literacy and the engagement? And so these are the questions we ask. Next slide. Uh, so that's the study. Next slide. Oh, okay. So yeah. So there is a. I thought we had the uh, the info address. It's on here. On here. Okay. Info i n f o at h b r c dot info. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So that's the email, um, and that, that's our phone number. If you'd like to know more about the study, uh, that's what you do. Thanks a lot. Hello, my name is Crystal Reed, and I'm the program director of the Health Policy Research Consortium. It was a pleasure to be here today at Delaware State University's Spring Policy Forum. Uh, it was very great to see all of the public health students and to be able to talk to them about real life experiences of how policy can affect your health outcomes. Uh, talking about the aspects of health and all policies, not just looking from a health policy perspective, but looking at all policies about like transportation to assure access to care, education, health literacy, as well as talking about the importance of public health safety issues, having safety in your neighborhoods, people feeling like that they have the ability to walk safely in their neighborhoods without uh, encountering any violence. Um, I believe that the public health issues are really on the horizon. It's really great to see a group of young researchers and educators that are really have a passion for the cause, and I'm looking forward to see what the future really brings in the realm of public health. Thank you again for having us here, and we really enjoy being a part of this magnificent forum.